don't see the regular video. Yeah, because I see the top. Okay, says the top. we're good. I'm just losing my mind. Alright, are you ready? Uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna bomb it. Cheers! <laughs> are you ready? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to Mama on the Move. Today we have um, my special guests Aiden and Greenberg. Say hi. Hello everyone. Hey, hey. howdy. And today we're just gonna be talking about life and the episode's gonna be called Risking It to Get the Biscuit. Hence why we have Biscuits, Colombian version, because um, I was on Jamaica Avenue, and that's really all they got there. So we got pan de bonos and some, oh wow, this is so good. Pan de queso? Pan de queso. You ready for your thumb in it? I know, that's how fluffy it is. All right, all right. Yeah, that's how you know it's good. Anyway, that's what the episode's going to be called, because me and my boys here, we're, we're on the move here. We're doing big things. We travel. We travel. I try. <laughs> But, um, yeah, uh, Greenberg and Aiden I met a few years ago through mutual friends from yeah. the Forest Hills gang because they all went to New Paltz. Um, Aiden, tell them a little bit about yourself. Well, me and, well, both me and Daniel went to Binghamton, so that's kind of cool if you think Binghamton's a cool place, which I don't, so it's not actually cool. But outside of that, um, this past year I've been living in France. Um, I'm no big deal. planning to do so coming uh, in this academic year as well. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a fairly decent French speaker. Language is kind of cool to me. Um, otherwise, I like handball. And <laughs> <laughs> my hobbies include? My hobbies include special interests on the resume. Sudoku, definitely up there. Okay. But, like, I don't know how I'm a big fan. Yeah, it keeps the brain. I mean, it keeps me uh, distracted on the train. Also, like for Alzheimer's, we're thinking long term. Okay. You keep doing that Sudoku, you're chilling. So anyway, my advice to y'all. Sudoku. <laughs> Sudoku. <laughs> yeah. That's a brief little resume. Okay, but can you tell us why you were in France? Oh, why I was in France. Okay. This is so, a little, little back. So I was teaching um, English to primary school kids. So a little French folk from like the ages of, say, 5 to 10 or 11. Okay. Um, in the hopes that, like, one, I could practice my French. Two, I could practice my teaching skills. And three, I get to be out in France and travel and see what's, what's good with Europe. My name's Greenberg. For those Daniel. who don't know me, my name is Daniel. But for uh, simple, simplification, I'm going to go as Greenberg. I know the name doesn't match the face. But um, <laughs> I met these two lovely people way back when, in simpler times, when things were easier, there was less stress in the world. And, uh, you know, we uh, I think we had a much uh, si more simplified look on life. Um, so this dates back to, with Aiden, I think, Middle school, high school, yeah. somewhere around there. We started getting close to middle school for sure. Yeah, and uh, with Monica was in uh, was at the start of college, and freshman year, I believe. Yeah, and uh, luckily both of these have uh, grown into these nice, successful friendships that I'm hoping to keep for a, a long time. Um, so, <laughs> my current stressor and situation is that I'm going to med school in my watch is dead uh, in three so days. Um, and I'm going to Buffalo, which is kind oh. of like the skid mark of New York State. No one's going there. Just the armpit That's armpit skid mark. No wings. No <laughs> wings. You're chilling. But uh, this whole med school <laughs> journey has been, <laughs> has obviously been a very stressful one, a very difficult one, and there's a lot of decisions that went into it that made me question what I was doing with my life. And uh, for once in my life, I, I'm looking at it with more excitement than with anxiety. And uh, hopefully we can get to talk about it a little bit more. And we will. So like I said, we're talking about risking it to get the biscuit. My biggest risk that I've taken thus far is going to California with no plan. Um, the only plan I had was to buy a car. And with that car, I have my freedom. And it will... You drove out to LA? Or you flew no. out and I flew out okay. and bought a used car because ain't nobody got time or money to buy, <laughs> I still got a, booty, buy so. a new car. Yeah, no, it's not even like that bad, but it's pretty old. It's a, you know, Toyota Solera 2000. It gets me from point A to B. Got a little sunroof. How's the MPG on it? The MPG miles per gallon. Are we eco-friendly or what's the um, asking? Not that eco-friendly because it's like a V6. It's like a sports car. Mm. Mm. So watch out. I mean, you are living that LA way. I am, and I don't need any four-wheel 
drive because it's not that crazy like the weather is over here. But anyway, that was a pretty big risk because I left with none of my family or friends. Even though I was staying with my family in California, I hadn't seen them in like 10 years. So mm -hmm. it was a, we had to respark the relationship. the relationship. They had to get to, they had to get used to Momo because, because I mean, I, mean I feel like so Monica and Momo, these are alter egos. <laughs> <laughs> Monica <laughs> is the person you present to your parents. Momo is who you present to your friends. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that, it wasn't hard getting used to, but I found my way, got my car right away, and from there I got my job, and then started this whole moment on move, and met some great people that like. Your ass has been exercising too. Oh, I haven't like, like, you know, we don't see those videos. Working out and shit, yeah. but y'all already know that. But these boys are making some big moves themselves. Mm -hmm. Like, is this the big? Are is France and um, medical, school. medical school, med school, the biggest risks you've had to take thus far? Yeah, until like I mean, high school there was a point where I transferred. Middle, like high schools where I went to Forest Hills. That was yeah. kind of like up until recently, okay. the biggest risk I took. Wait, where did you transfer from? I went from the Baccalaureate School of Global Education in Astoria to Forest Hills awesome. High School. A lot less fancy than we you expect. Get those we had a cafe gym 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 gym. Gym. Yeah, We had a cafe gymatorium. So like, we're talking about a cafeteria that was used for our winter concerts and as a gymnasium once in a while. So that's what we're working okay. with. Then I love, I have a lot of love for that school. Don't get me wrong, all my BSG fam, but it was just not the right place for me to transfer. But then more recently, like a year and a half ago, mm -hmm. I was just, you know, I was living in, in Florida. I was like, I, I need to get, I need to go somewhere else. I just need somewhere else to be. So yeah. I applied to this program called Tapif. And Tapif? Tapif. <laughs> There's an accent There's a, somewhere uh, in there. Accent de Guse. Or the, yeah, so <laughs> um, I applied to that, like, I don't know nobody out in France. I'm not French for what it's worth. That's even crazy. And I'm like, fuck it, like let's do it. Let's let's go out there and I oh, wait, it's a curse on this, by the way. Oh hell yeah. Oh. Have you watched my podcast? <laughs> oh. <laughs> have to see. Oh, oh this changed everything. No, but um The ball I mean you don't have to restrain yourself. Oh. I it's really hard. I have a sailor's mouth, so it's just kind of a part of like the way in which I speak. So. Well, um so Tapif is this program where they place um English speakers from all over the world um into French middle school, high schools, and elementary schools to kind of supplement their um, English language education. So you get kids from India, Australia, all the UK, Canada, United States predominantly. So I went out there not knowing nobody, um, except I did have my best friend living in Paris at the time, um, although I did not live in Paris. I know it's a kind of a common trope that, oh, I moved to no, France, must be really Paris. Howdy. But no, nah, I was in like the boonies in France. Like where? Like I feel like I ended up in the boonies by accident with Alexa. Oh, like on our arrival. Now this was this was like three and a half hour uh, train ride outside of Paris. But like I'm three trains, um, a town of seven thousand people. I was not a. I didn't have like full say in that. So ideally, it would have been a city okay. because coming from Queens to a town of seven thousand was yeah was. You, you, That's you, a cool shot. Yeah, you keep in mind our high school was five thousand kids. Yeah, so. yeah. It's like there's there's more people in the block here than yeah. there was all open. Yeah, people place. from Forest Hills think I went to Forest Hills when I didn't go there. <laughs> this is big enough school because nobody yeah. knows. But they just like by the personality, they're like, oh, look mm -hmm. like a Forest Hills kid. Oh, for sure. But anyway, I love. I end up loving the program, but going into it like because I've lived in, Par in Paris once before. And I just remember the amount of anxiety I had for that first move. And this move was not just that. First time was two months, mm -hmm. and this time was closer to nine. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I have my whole life in like a couple bags. I pull up to the airport, and then I got to find my way. Fucking urine. How do you say urine with a French accent? <laughs> <Bruh. laughs> Where did the accent go? I I see someone asked me this before, and I, I wish I had an answer. My my French slang is not particularly impressive. It's not. You'll get there. Problem. Nah, I mean, like, their, their slang is, is out of this I world, mean, though. Maybe. It's out of this world. But yeah, so, I mean, just the, just the travel of this town, I have, like, four bags on me, go through, like, three, four different trains, just to get, like, for four hours, sweating my ass off, like, no, not knowing where my seat is, I'm, like, walking up and down these small aisles and these trains. We finally pull up, and it's just like, I just see the town for the first time, like, all right, it is kind of cute-ish. Like, I was looking for the charm. I was like, it's sort of there, but, like, it is. it was really kind of a rundown, like, town. I guess it has that, um... Rustic feel. 
I sure. Think. Like, if you went to, like, you know, the, like, Binghamton, the Southern Tier used to be, like, much more economically, like, driven, and then, okay. like, IBM and other industries left, and then it kind of like, went a bit to shit. That is a similar situation to what happened in some of the towns around there. Okay. So it was it was definitely run down and beat up, but it had like, it did have a charm that grew on me quite. Okay. Um, well, I guess the, one of my questions would be then is, you know, sometimes when you take a big risk and you have everything planned out of how you want it to, to pan out, mm -hmm. in an idealistic situation, you're just banking on that happening to eliminate some of that anxiety. And when That's you get to that way. point, <laughs> exactly, and you get to that point, you realize everything that you had planned did not actually happen. Yeah. Like it's not it's not unfolding it's the way it should be. Definitely not the way be. that I. Exactly, and, and I feel as though that's that's something natural in life. So I guess uh, you know when you when you came to France into this this small village, and you realized this is not what I imagined at all. What is you know some of that emotion that came out at first? Oh, I was. Was I it mean, like I regret? Like wow, I really. I, would, I never though. regretted it, which is like I think it was great because I mean it was definitely tough being kind of isolated like that, mm -hmm. and just also being in such a different kind of environment. But I always try to look at that silver lining of like, okay, I'm in France right now. Like, yeah. This is really cool. I, not a lot of people have this opportunity. I'm very fortunate for that. Um, the people with whom I had to interact in terms of my, my, my stay administratively mm -hmm. happen to be some really incredible individuals. And I super, I lucked out. Honestly, the in people that, that you meet along the way makes a big difference mm -hmm. on how you react to a certain situation, at least for me. Because mm -hmm. I come from a background of a huge support system like when I was leaving for California like mm. you guys kind of made it freaking hard to leave because like everyone's yeah. like why would you why would you leave us like mm. like what what's wrong with what you got here but like they were also like don't come back until you you make it yeah. like I don't want you here until you do what you were meant so to do out there I'm gonna respectfully not be in that group of people I wasn't the one who said don't come back until you've made it I was <laughs> no, like, no, my, my, my like Alexa and all of them they were just like um I mean, I'm gonna miss you, but like, do what you gotta do out mm, there no. because I know that's what's gonna make you happy. Yeah. I guess I'm selfish in that way. I was like, listen, if it works, it listen, works. If it doesn't, back. it doesn't. But if you're back in two and a half <laughs> months, I'm gonna start calling some people up. Yeah, I gotta visit. <laughs> now that was actually a hard decision for me to make was to come back or not during like the halfway point. But yeah. I was just like, fuck it, I'm out here. I'm just gonna stay out here. But I, I did definitely help to have, the, as you mentioned, the support system. Because my parents did come to visit. I had a cousin. Two different cousins who visited me. Jake came. Yeah. Jake came. Yeah. Uh, my friend Oliver, my best friend Oliver, he was living in Paris. So I, yeah. and he was at least in the same time zone as me. And my other really good friend, Netta, was out there um, in uh, the region of Montpellier, actually a town called Bézier. And just having a few people in my time zone yeah. was so important because that six hour difference. No, and then it was like, crazy. I was like, yeah, everyone's getting off work, I'm about to go sleep, and then like, I miss everyone. So like, when yeah. I get open in the morning, I'm like, social media is kind of lit right now. But, only because I have all these notifications, but no one's actually. Because I haven't been on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no one's awake. It, 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 you know, it's, it's very interesting that you say that because I remember I saw a couple months back I FaceTimed you and it was four in the morning here, the morning and it was here. one a.m. over yeah, at my we, time. I'm like, what the hell is he doing <laughs> yeah, up right no. now? <laughs> um, but you know, we ended up talking for literally an hour, two, an hour, hours, two hours, and uh, I hadn't spoken to you before that. I don't know, a couple of months. Yeah, we had to so, catch up. Yeah, so you know, to catch up in that hour amount of time and figure out like, I need to consolidate what's happened in the past year into an hour of conversation with you, which you probably won't remember because it's four in the morning Are and you? I don't know why you're up. <laughs> um, but no, it's it's it, it's nice to connect with people like that. It really it provides a sense of uh, you know that support, but also purpose is that. You know, people are, are they want you to do yeah, the check, what you yeah, have to do. And I feel like sure it, it, gives, it gives you like a little like, oh, reality check. Oh, I, like a reminder as to what, yeah. why you're doing it. How far you've come. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, it's a grounding thing. It's at least like your roots didn't forget about you. Yeah. They're still there. And the fact that you can have a conversation with these people and it's, Obviously, you do miss each other, but it's, it's not like you need to go through this awkward phase of yeah. reintroducing each other again. Know. It's it's basically, I haven't seen you in mad long, tell me everything, like, I want to hear the ups, I want to hear the downs, I want to hear all the fucked up shit you did, but also all the good stuff. And having something like that creates a sense of comfort that there are people behind me who are backing me. Yeah. Like, no matter what I ended up doing, like, there's going to be a group of people who are going to say, listen, do you, we're backing you every step of the way, yeah. while we may not agree some of the time, like, you have a hold on your life, a grasp on your life way better than I do, mm -hmm. so just, you know, go for it, and, you know, we hope for the best. Of course. Yeah. And what do you think, um, you know, going off and doing these big risks that you've 
guys have taken. Like, what is, I guess, the scariest part of taking that risk for you? Like, you going to med school, like, what's at stake? Yeah, um, so for those of you who don't know, med school, the entire medical school journey to becoming a doctor is a very long and vigorous one. And, uh, you know, you do your undergrad, which is four years. I took five to double major, which in hindsight, I probably should not have done that. I should have just taken the steps to grow up a little bit quicker. Um, you do your four years of medical school, um, which is a, a very difficult regimen of classes and clinicals. And you come out four years later with arguably the highest educational degree in the United States system, but now you have to do your residency, which is kind of like being the bitch of the hospital for four to five years, making, when you factor in the number of hours, less than a McDonald's worker. Mm -hmm. uh, so then that nice. puts me at about 31, 32. Then you do your fellowship if you want to specialize. I do want to specialize. I want to do trauma surgery. And uh, so that's another four or five years where you're making a little bit more money, but nowhere near as much as you should be. So at the age of 35 to 36, you come out, you have all your degrees, your training, but now you're at the bottom of the totem pole. And if something happens along the way that could, you know, throw you off that track, well, yeah, you're back at square one. And for me, the hardest part... It was at this moment that he knew he fucked up. Looking at it as if the, the, the best years of my life are going to be spent in a classroom or going to be spent in a textbook. And coming to terms with that was so difficult for me because I watch all of my friends who now have successful jobs, who are moving out, who are starting new lives, new families. And for me, it's I'm going back. I almost felt as though I was taking a step backwards. And uh, to come to terms with that and realize that I'm doing this because I believed in the deeper meaning to what uh, I'd be doing as a doctor mm -hmm. is kind of the driving force um, to allow me to, to be able to embark on such a journey like this. And, you know, I come from a family of entirely medical professionals, so I have doctors, no nurses, pressures. pharmacists, <laughs> exactly. And um, my older brother, I'm when it came, exhausted listening through the process. I'm like, wow. <laughs> when it came time to choose a major, he's older than me. He called me up on the phone. He said, "Daniel, there's no way in hell I'm becoming a doctor, and mom is gonna make one of us become the doctor. So you're in." And I was tag, like, tag you, you. In. I was just like yeah. tag bags, basically. So you know, it's. Oh, at first, at but the, we need a doctor in our group. Yeah, so apparently we need a doctor. So <laughs> I gotta get my shit together quicker. But you know, I'm, I'm excited. I'm also a little nervous, but it's more excitement than anxiety. And I'm just, uh, you know, I'm willing to, to open up this new chapter in my life because I felt as though I had reached a period of, of stagnancy, and that is one of the biggest drivers for yeah. for wanting to make a change. Is you feel as though you're not making any forward progress. Yeah, that's kind of. I feel that I was gonna ask you guys like, what was the driving force to making this? huge decision um but you already said it i kind of felt the same way I'm, i'll ask you right after but i kind of felt the same way like the reason why i felt i had to go to california was like it was always in the back of my mind as a, like you visited a few times prior to right? uh the only time i visited was when i was 14 okay. <laughs> mad long ago my aunt bought me my flight and she kind of like it was like a birthday gift I loved it, but as an actor, I was like, I gotta be California. Mm -hmm. Like, hello, that's that is the mecca for you know entertainment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I am from like New York too. It's like I could do it on either coast. It was nice to get a taste of both sides. But I wanted to see what was up, mm -hmm. and at that point in my life, I just kind of didn't know. I didn't have a stable career. I mean, like, I was doing well with Vita Loba. We all know that story. Whatever. <laughs> um, but being in like, I could do social media and marketing and all that good stuff. Like, and I was doing well mm -hmm. at it. I just felt like that's not what I really wanted to do. And then I kind of lost focus of my acting career. And I kind of was like, this, that's what I want to do. Yeah. So being here in New York with my friends and family is super distracting. So it was just like going out here, going out there. And you guys know that I was a nomad in New York. Because yeah, yeah. my family's from Long Island, but all my deep friends, Long Island, though. deep yeah. Long Island, and yes, I have my friends in Long Island too. But then all my college friends are from Queens, Brooklyn, Manhattan. So like, I would spend and work was out here for me too. So I was going back and forth and like trying to please everyone, but also I obviously want to be with my people. Exhausting. But like, I was just it was exhausting. I felt like I wasn't going anywhere, and like I had no commitments to anyone or anything. And I was like, "All right, well, this is the time." Mm -hmm. And like I was young, and I didn't want to be like I was young. Like, <laughs> so long ago. No, I'm no. wise and old now. I'm so wise. naive. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, that kind of the staying comfortable it gives me anxiety because like I feel like that's when 
you just... I think you stagnate with the world. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, you become stagnant, and I think one of the biggest uh, things to come to term with and it's a sense of maturity is you need to learn how to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yeah. And when you get to that point and you, you kind of break out of the confines of this comfort zone that you mm-hmm. created, you can actually start to discover new things and unlock new right. potential and, and, and you know feed off of that and hopefully create this positive enabler that'll allow you to go into you know whatever trajectory you'd like to go into. Yeah. And my acting coach was like, that's like the one thing you don't want to be. You don't want to be comfortable, especially in that because like each job is different and you have to be kind of like on top of lot, yeah. you have to be on top of like what's next. Like mm-hmm. you can't just be comfortable, oh I just did that commercial, I think I'll be good for it. and then just forget. Like you have to stay consistent. Consistency is key, I guess, to getting to where you want to be. But, sure. Wait, so what was, what was that question? That question was, <laughs> uh, what was the driving force for you to oh. make making that big decision? I mean, friends. I will say it was like a three birds, one stone thing. So I do, yeah, I want to be educated. Birds. Yeah, I was, Not just two. Right, no, no, not just two. I have been some. So, um, what's the phrase in French? It's trois coups, un pire, something like that. But, um, yeah. for me, it was like, I want to be an educator, which I discovered kind of late in my college career um, after doing an internship. Um, I also doing three majors. I did two majors. I did two majors. Political science and economics. Do I use either of them? Pretty much no, but like, <laughs> it is a decent um, background of knowledge for the sake of what I want to get into, which is teaching social studies at the high school level. Um, so it is so at least mildly relevant. Um, but yeah, so I was like, okay, I want to become a teacher. Um, so I need to work on my teaching skills. Regardless of like what subject I'm teaching, I want to work on my teaching skills. Um, I want to get my friendship. I see a lot of value in the second language. Um, I agree. I, I think agree. most most countries will yeah. make it mandatory to learn uh, a second language or a third language with actual proficiency, as opposed to the American education I mean, system where you stop learning. Yeah, it so it's, it's, it's kind of a joke here. Whereas, like, I'm in these classrooms in like first grade and it's full immersion, basically. And it, well, I wouldn't say it's full immersion, but at the very least, are exposed to an actual like English speaker versus uh-huh. like their French teachers who love them to death, but weren't exactly, you know, prime candidates to teach English to these right. kids. You know, you see certain linguistic traits that should not carry over into the language. But, um, so yeah, so there was the education element. So even though I'm teaching English and I want to teach history, I still felt value in getting comfortable within a classroom setting and getting comfortable with like, all right, what does a curriculum look like? Asking questions to the teachers, um, and getting a sense of like what the job will inevitably entail, even if it is a different education system. It's similar enough. You get you get the idea. Um, and the third reason, outside of you know honing my French skills, honing my teaching skills, was mm-hmm. I get to travel around. I get to. Yeah. And it was a part time job, so I had freaking four days a week. Um, so every weekend, I was like hitting you know one of the few different towns in the region, and meeting up with other language assistants. I actually built a pretty nice network out there. Nice. And that was for me like whenever I go, if I'm taking a big risk, going to a whole new environment. Building in relationships is, is super Not important because otherwise, teams. like, you're just going to, one, be bored out of your mind, but outside of that, you just need someone to talk to, someone to vent to, oh, and especially with the language barrier that existed. Like, I'm in, by no means fluent in French. And, yeah. and it, it sounds a lot better you're from the outside. Good. It sounds yeah, a lot better I guess from, I don't yeah. even know what you're yeah. saying. I can say whatever you want, and y'all don't believe, like, wow. that's good French, yeah. Good job, Aiden. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so proud Sometimes of you. you got to fake it till you make it. Well, that's kind of what it is. Like, with language, you're like, all right, let me see what I can get away with. And I had some, I made some, some French acquaintances, and I had, I made some decent relationships out there, but it was hard breaking past a certain point, especially with, like, the slang that, like, mm-hmm. the younger folk use, which is not what I learned in the textbook. It's right. not what I've learned in my work in Paris either or like what I see on the internet and it's just it's just very difficult to get used to but having that network once I met other language assistants like myself honestly they probably so see you as an advantage too they're like oh shit that's a great connect to the United States oh for like, sure for sure and I feel like almost it might be it might be better to I guess learn another language before learning English just because I feel like it's almost mandatory everywhere you go to just know English just when, okay, like for my cousin, for example, he's visiting from the Dominican Republic. Okay. He's been, but like his parents are, he got his, um, you know, social security. He's like a citizen now. Because he, what they want him to finish his last year of college in the United States just because it's easier for him job wise, like long term wise. But over there, like almost every school in the Dominican Republic 
teaches English and in, like the United States history mm -hmm. just because mm -hmm. it's so dominant yeah. like here you're not gonna learn all the other languages and their histories I mean yeah, yeah you do but it's all like I feel like altered to make obviously America we, we could do a lot better one. on that front for sure yeah so I feel like English is like a priority yeah. in other countries so I mean, I, I just didn't want to be that American who's just going to throw my hands up and be like, you know what, I'm going to give up on the language that I was learning. And I had an amazing question. And I'm glad you did that. Because I, I just, I, I didn't want to be that stereotypical American, name. I guess. <laughs> give us a better name. Give us a better name. And it, it is interesting what how much more you can discover about a culture by knowing the language. I mean, it just yeah. it goes hand in hand, language and culture. So. not everything translate over, yeah. translates over the same way. 100%. And it, it, even though I didn't always, I probably understood maybe like, on average, seventy percent of where I was hearing, depending mm -hmm. on who was talking to you, is seventy-five. You know, it still felt like one. I was progressing in my understanding, but just like I felt more and more accepted, more and more a part of like the community from a periphery. But still, like I mean, within a year, you know, you're with the same people for a long time. You build relationships inside yeah. the community, being as small as it was, and you know, it made the risk that much, that so so much worth, so worth it. Because I was yeah. just like, wow, like. I, I, I really, like, I was leaving that town and like I went into it, you know, kind of with this impression of, it's, it's kind of like, you know, I don't want to say shithole, but I'm, I already said it, but, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, like, it, it definitely had like a, a lot left to be desired and I left being like, I'm going to really miss the, the people that I met here and like, you know, a few, a few like little places within the town that were just either beautiful or just kind of made me feel, you know, whether it be food spots or just like, there's actually a beautiful church there little historical things that kind of kept me like engaged and leaving i was just like you know it was a very touching moment seeing saying bye to the students and you know it but it makes it all worth it once it does once you're like all right i put myself out there and yeah. here we are like we made it we made it through i'm going back because we're, we're ready for another another minor adventure yeah i didn't think i was gonna miss california as much as i did coming back to new york just because like once i got to california i was like oh my god i can't wait mm -hmm. to go back to new york and you know spend that time but like i also was excited to see the progress that i was going to make you know being on this journey alone mm -hmm. kind of because i had you guys like supporting me on the other side of the country yeah, you know, but um isolated in a real sense yeah no and then when leaving when i left after building all these relationships with my coworkers, my coach my boxing coach mm -hmm. My my family that I had out there in California, it was like, damn, now you guys are making it hard to leave <laughs> California. And I was like, all right, I'm excited to come back and enter this new chapter being for like more independently on yeah. my own just because I got my own apartment. Um, so you guys need to come visit because 10 minutes I'm, from the airport. I'm trying to save lives and I'm going to be broke the entire time. So um, unless you fly me out with your acting salary, I don't listen, think Listen, if I land a big role, I've got you. I got you. Let me just get my break. Let me just get my break. <laughs> well, this actually is, is a great segue to, into one of the next topics I want to talk about, which is, you know, we're talking about our biggest risks in our lives. But at the end of the day, you know, you are taking all kinds of risks in your daily lives. Yeah. Um, you know, some of them more prominent than others, but virtually every one of the decisions that you make involves some sort of risk. Mm -hmm. um, and through my experiences, I've learned that one of the biggest things that I had to get over was dealing with uncertainty. I always, when I was making decisions, and it prevented me from really enjoying my life, was I didn't want uncertainty. I wanted to be able to make a decision and know exactly what the turnout was going to be, how everything was going to pan out. Yeah. And if it didn't, if, if, it, if it, there wasn't a high degree of certainty, I wouldn't make that decision. Yeah. So, so you were not direction. risking it. Yeah. The so and what I realized is I was depriving myself of an entire window of opportunity, and you see this in these big decisions like moving, you see these big decisions in relationships, you see these big decisions in deciding what you want to do for breakfast. <laughs> and, uh, that's, you know, that's all of these things create a cascading effect. And for me, I guess one of the questions I can ask both of you is, well, what is the biggest strength that you have? Or what is the biggest attribute? And it can be one word or two words that really help you push yourself over the edge. You know, Will, I, I think I was watching a, a video on Will Smith and he goes, basically, happiness is on the other side of fear. Or once you cross that barrier, that's where the happiness is. And, I, you know, that really stuck to me. So for me, one of my biggest strengths was this, like, sense of resilience, adaptability. And it's this idea that once, you know, you can take this risk, but you have to be accepting that if it doesn't work, well, it didn't work. It doesn't mean that you should stop going down that path. It just means now you got to try it again a different way. And you have to be able to adapt yourself. It's never going to be perfect. But 
life is about compromise. You have to be ready to fail when mm -hmm. you take that risk. Exactly. And so. people are afraid to meet that failure because they think it, that's it. It speaks There's, about like, oh, maybe it's, it shakes them to their core in terms of why I was a person. No, yeah, it's I know, a, I know a lot of people that just like quit when it gets tough. But I'm like, I'm that kind of person that that's just not in my personality. Like, yeah. I don't stop until I get what I want, We're, pretty much. So and, the, I guess so. This would be the question: Is for someone who has already, I wouldn't say perfected, but has drastically improved this skill of taking risks, what would be advice? Like, what attribute would you give as an advice to someone else who isn't ready to take on the risk but wants to? That's a good question, Dream, right? It's like you're all um, 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 I would say definitely persistence is key and kind of just finding what makes you happy and not what makes others happy because that was kind of like that's kind of like my uh, I guess fault sometimes. Like I have I guess perfected it in a sense, like, you know, adapting to new adventures and being able to, you know, Risking you know, to get the biscuit, but I just think yeah, that one of these bad boys. Yeah, <laughs> I, there's probably no one. Oh, well, no, there's that still bad bad. Bad. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't drop. But I would say just you know find what makes you happy Wait, and with time out. Yeah, you know, really tell us how the fun that one is. No, it's actually pretty far. No. So good. Oh, should I so get that now? The earthy aroma <laughs> and, and you know I think that, it's a seventy-one shit. That's an oaky <laughs> afterbirth. <laughs> <going>. <laughs> Very good. No, it's got that butter though, like in the middle. Yeah. Wait till you try the cheese one. That is delicious. Sorry. Sorry. It's alright. Now that I made my mouth real dry. <laughs> no, I'm trying to think. So strength. I think you got to figure out what your strength is in terms of like, all right, if you take a big risk, like, don't focus too much on like your weaknesses. And for me, my strength is like I'm. I can be very sociable. So when I go to a new place, like like when I went to France, I was like, all right, I got no friends. Um, so what are we going to do about that? So I was like, all right, let's start just randomly talking to people, like, in my building, the apartment I was living in, teachers, like, hey, if the student want to be my friend, I was like, hey, yo, like, let's chill at recess, like, we'll talk about Marvel. There was one kid, we always talk about Marvel. being open-minded. I was like, I was just trying to find outlets for, you know, for my energy, so that I just, I didn't feel like, for my, my biggest fear at the time was like, all right, like, I won't have anyone to talk to, I won't, I, I, I'll just, like, Maybe be ostracized. Well, not so much no one talked to, but just feel ostracized because of like Asian American, American and like you know it's a rural place. I don't know what's no, good with like, like yeah, I don't, and also I mean, for not not for nothing, but France's rural population typically leans more conservatively. And there's like a very like um, a lot of people voted for Le Pen. So if you don't follow much of French politics, he was very very right wing well, individual. And after I play my Sudoku, you know, there's a reason. There's a reason why, like, you know, she pulled a lot of the suburbs, and the, not so much the suburbs, but you know, like, you know, rural areas. And so I got into the area coming from like a much more far, off, much farther left place along the political spectrum, and like that was another like fear I had, where I was like, like, how much can I say, and like, will people accept like my beliefs relative to their own? And I was like, all right, if I just focus on like being social, just like you know, just being there for the for a good time and like bringing decent energy. Good and then the sense but it was you made quick. the long time a good time. It was so by quick though. That like, at the end of the day, I was like, it felt like a snap. I was like, oh, I'm I'm already on the plane now. If, if, like find your strength. If it's being social, it's being social. If it's like working hard, then like you know, just or if it's if it's like taking your time, that's cool too. I don't think there's gotta be a rush on everything, depending on like what that industry. Oh is. yeah, it's baby steps to yeah. get to where you. Want I mean, to for like as like for your situation, Daniel, with the whole being a doctor, like that's there's, there's no way to shortcut that. Really, yeah. it's well, just like you gotta be persistent yeah. and be patient. Well, you know that actually, it's, it's a great way to one of the other things I wanted to ask you guys, which was one of the biggest things is fear. It's, it's yeah. fear. It's it's just this idea that you won't get the approval that you want. You won't get the results that you want. You won't be get. You won't get seen in the light that you want to be seen in. And by the time you figure that out, it might be too late. So, um, some people say live with no regrets. The typical Tumblr saying: live, laugh, love, no regrets, and whatever. And no you know, yeah, you know, <laughs> you know I look at it and I say like, this is such out. utter bullshit. Like, I don't, listen, I, I am a pessimist, but I've been <laughs> transitioning into practical optimism. Um, and for me, practical optimism was have a positive outlook of life in the realm of reality. Yeah. Yeah. So don't just say, you know what, every day I'm going to wake up sniffing daisies and I'm going to walk across the rainbow and oh. dance into the sunset. Life fucking throws you 
curveballs and obstacles and, and you have to learn how to fucking exactly. grow from that. Those periods of adversity, those periods of turbulence are what make you you. It's how you adapt to it. And um, I forgot where I was going with this one. Oh, I was dealing with fear, fear. no regrets. Yeah, fear. So what are your thoughts? Like, um, you know, how do you, do you have any, any regrets? Like, do you have regrets doing what you do? And should there be something that's no regrets? I, because for me, I'm just going to, real yeah. quickly, like some people say, don't ever have any regrets. Of course I have regrets. There's a lot of things I mean, I've done in my life where I'm just like, shit. Moments. I think it's more yeah. about like learning to get over those regrets and understanding like, all right, they, like it I already think, happened. Yeah, you like, can't hold on what are we going to do? To, like, like don't, don't hold grudges with your fucking yeah, regrets. Like, you have to be able to move on. And I just think everything happens for a reason. And you have to be able to learn from that mistake that you made in the past. Because mm -hmm. otherwise, if you're indulging in that, like, whatever emotion you felt during that regretful period, I just think you're not going to grow and you're just, that's how you get stagnated. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, and again, that's, that's kind of what I wanted to get at was that, is it okay to regret things? hundred percent. I mean, yes, but okay? don't hold on. So yeah. it's, it's kind of transitioning. Well, is it regret or are you reflecting? And I uh, think, yeah, if you get to reflection, that's good. Because like, if you regret and then you're just holding this grudge against like yourself, that's bad. But if you're like, all right, what can I learn from that moment? Yeah, you just get bitter and salty and like, then you're a buzzkill at every party. It's just like, yeah, peace. So you, you see it as like, <laughs> there's rags to riches and there's regret to reflection. And it's being able to look at your past. I think I'm going to make that a hashtag. Regret <laughs> to <laughs> reflection. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> geez, I'm on the move. And the liberation. Yeah, we're, we're, we're getting super on liberation. But uh, no, it's, it's a, that period where you're able to look at something in your past or something in your future and say, you know what, like, rather than delving it in a negative way, have this take over my entire life, cast this shroud of doubt, I'm just going to be able to reflect on it and say, this is what I learned, this is what I didn't learn, and this is how I'm going to move forward from it. Mm -hmm. And given that all three of us are now, or have already taken this big step, or are going to take on this big step, it's being able to say to ourselves, you know, I'm going to make mistakes. Oh, that's, that's inevitable. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to go down a path and realize, holy shit, <laughs> i got to make a big U-turn, or where's the detour, or you know, yeah, things like that. Just, but it's like touch the adaptability. Yeah, like and, and like yeah. things, it's... it's this concept that, well, you're still driving your own like metaphoric car, you're still the one in control, and you're going to be the one to steer yourself out or not. Yeah. You're not it's not like at a, at a road test or, or when you were in driving school where you had your student driver next to you who had his, his foot oh, on the gas in the brake ready yeah. to do something. It was, it's on you now. Like, fly, my butterfly. Go do it right now. And then and if you fuck up, like, good. So well, we're building off of that, that, that um, analogy. Um, you know, you can only control your car. Like, there's a whole ass road out here. Like, if you start worrying about the dumbass that's, that's coming in the other direction, like, yeah, it, could, it like, may not be your fault, but you need to learn how to, you know, bounce back. Yeah, you gotta bounce back. And like, if you need a venue, you just like go on, go on the side of the road, get some help. Like, don't do that. If you want to, like, I'm just gonna try to get to the next exit. Do that. Do you gotta figure it out for yourself. But you know, don't be don't be afraid to like for some bad thing to happen. Yeah. Because, I mean, plenty of shit happened when I was in France. Where I was like. God fucking damn it. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? But if I, at the end of the day, my only regrets really when I was out there was um, not doing as much as I could to get involved in the community. Like, I just felt, I felt like, I, like it took me a while to feel welcomed. And I was always okay. like, there's a very different culture there. It's like a lot less, allowed, there's a lot more po like politeness in certain mm -hmm. aspects of life. And there's a certain kind of vocabulary and language skills that come with that politeness that like I don't always exercise in English yeah. and it's hard to transition and translate between the two. So I think going into this year, like it's so not to make it a regret. What do we to expect it, to find different? It's like they're re reflecting on like or oh, what would I have done differently or what could I have done that I didn't do? You know, try to get more involved in my community, find more extracurriculars to do outside of because I was just like, all right, I would work and then it was a really small town, so I'd maybe I'd run a run do like a quick run or I feel like staying like... active has actually helped help me stay on track, and oh. I feel like it's always helped me stay on yeah. track and get to me and get to where the point that I'm here right now. Because boxing, I feel like when I train, my coach is always he, the Mexican way to fight is kind of like this reciprocation. Like it's not about the initial hit; it's how you hit follow after up, getting follow. follow up after getting hit. Like mm -hmm. that's how they win fights. They're all about their the counter. The counter attack. Mm. So I don't know. Boxing there's, has like there's a famous Rocky saying. Oh, there's a, a famous saying. It's not. It's not how hard you get hit. It's how 
Good. Somehow yeah. getting back up. Right? Getting back up after you get the get point. It. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. Google. <laughs> Alexa. <laughs> no, I. <Yes>, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's all about the reciprocation and the bounce back, mm -hmm. um, like you said. But Greenberg, I know you've been asking us all the questions. Yeah, and yeah. You kind of are talking about the big, big risk that you haven't taken yet. Thank God. What What are you doing? I guess in preparation to take on this medical journey that you're about to embark? Well, I'd say a lot of it is pent-up anxiety, <laughs> but I'm trying to transform that into, into this excitement that I'm ready to propel myself into what could be a very successful future. Um, and that's also like making sure I have this support system that's there for me that is going to help me every step of the way. And that's why you're spending every single moment with yeah. your friends and family before you leave. I think. <laughs> so the last month has been really me trying to see exhausting. everything. It's exhausting. Okay, exhausting. And everyone is being selfish because I'm the one leaving, yet I have to go and travel to see everybody else. Regardless, the point is that the past Sorry. month I've been trying to see everybody that had made an impact on my life and someone that I want to keep in my life. And, uh, you know, trying to say my last goodbyes, even though it's not really like a goodbye goodbye. I'm only seven hours away, which yeah. sounds actually terrible. Nobody thinks about it. Oh my God. No so one wants to. <laughs> come to Cali. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the prep is just yeah. being able to find myself at some type of stable equilibrium where I can say it's okay to be nervous. Yeah. It's okay to be excited. It's okay to, to feel this, this pent up anxiety. And so it's finding a stability within yourself. Yeah, I guess. and I feel as though before I can make moves and try to make other people happy and try to, to, to take these next steps forward, it's kind of finding that balance in myself. And that is one of the most critical things that I can tell everybody who's watching this podcast, and I'm sure Monica has touched Definitely. upon it several times before. It's just the sense that you need to find that happiness in yourself. You need to be able to reach that balance yeah. where you can, you can be okay with the things that you do and not regret it so much if it doesn't go your way. I think at this point in our lives, being, you know, young, 20-something year olds, taking these big risks, you gotta be selfish. Like, this is your time to be selfish, because you right. never know what, like, you can be married next year with five kids, I don't know, but that's when you're like, Just and honestly, like, <laughs> you never know, like, you never know, like, so I think Shut right up. now, <laughs> right now is the time to be selfish and to it's okay. I know Greenberg, me and you are big people pleasers. Like we try to do everything we can to make other people feel happy just because their happiness brings us happiness. I yep. get that. But I think this is the time to, you know, be selfish, do find what makes you happy and kind of us like on top of working consistently to get to where you need to be. You need to work self care. I'm a big proponent of oh, like shit. you need to really make sure you so are in tune so with tricky, yourself <laughs> and I think that's if you balance both of that out, I don't I think there's no way you can't succeed. So yeah. Greenberg, I know you could do this. I know you could do this. We're about to change the world, we people. Are, yeah. We're movers on the move here. I'm trying to give a little motivation here. Um no, oh, motivation. Like what? Wait a second, that's that shit right now. So yeah. Yeah. No, but that's but, that's valid. I mean honestly, yeah, being like having this conversation and like Knowing that I'm gonna go back in about a month or so, it's like it just it, it's it's so great to hear like like it's a little encouragement. I think you need to hear that from friends. And again, yeah. like getting back to any risk, it's gets that much easier with the support system. Yeah, and it's just knowing you have friends, even if you don't talk all the time. I don't know, like me and Daniel would once in a while send memes to each other when I was in France, and like all when it came through, it was fucking great. It was just great. Like it just I like, but you know we understood that being a far away yeah. like you know communication in the regular sense is not really feasible and I think for a lot of my friends I appreciate that they understood that yeah you know you try to like if you're gonna risk it you're gonna immerse yourself in a whole new environment where you really have to dedicate yourself to whatever crap you're trying to exactly. do you're gonna not be available in the same way and it's like and again to your selfishness points like you gotta focus on yourself and that doesn't mean like you know being a complete dickhead yeah but, like, forgetting means, everyone and becoming Hollywood yeah, yeah, trust yeah, me yeah. That's, <laughs> that's you though but you know just <laughs> just just uh you know just Come find that equilibrium. It's like, all right, like, I can focus on myself a lot. Stay in contact as best I can, but like, yeah. hopefully your friends and like people around you understand. And like, I, you know, just it's, I just it's just, and I'm hoping I can send that to everyone else. Is the sense of practical optimism. 
we live in a society right now where we're looking at social media, you look at the best couples and the best people are doing the best jobs and you're striving to be that and when you don't get to that point, you're saying to yourself, you're beating yourself up saying, why am I not at that point yet? Well, number one is stop comparing yourselves to others. It's your life, it's the life that you are living, and it's their life, it's their life that they're living. You don't know what went through. While, you can, through. while you can relish it and say, wow, they're living a good life, well, this is yours, these are the cards that you're dealt, and you're gonna be dealing it with it, uh, you're gonna be dealing with it your own way. The second thing is that <laughs> the second thing is that you you know you have to have this the sense that things can go wrong. It's not always gonna be days and I, I I can't like stress that enough. Stress that enough is that you need to be optimistic mm -hmm. in the realm of reality. Yeah. yeah. So like, don't get paralyzed. Otherwise, you're just gonna be like sadness and fucking inside out with a little rainbow over your head. And yeah. And you know, on that subject though, real quick, like if y'all, if you do have some going through some mental health shit, which like you know, it happens to a lot of people, definitely reach out to somebody, whether yeah. it be family or like a professional, if you can like, like swing it. on the move. Because like. You know, I think the day, great, like he's a great therapist. Yeah. Sadness is real, and like depression is real, anxiety is real. And sometimes you kind of, I mean, I do. I have like a big ego, and I kind of try to shove those sadness feelings away. But uh, yeah. being able, oh. be, I mean, like I, I think I've gotten better with it, and I've tried to work on that all the time. Mm -hmm. And you know, building these strong relationships that I've had so far have helped me, like, kind of. I know that these people aren't going to judge me for what I do, that I know they're going to love me at the end of the day. So don't be afraid to, you know, express yourself when you need it the most. Yeah. Like, everyone needs a hug. I get that. Yeah, but be vulnerable sometimes. Be vulnerable. Just be vulnerable. Allow yourself to be, it's be human. Like, yeah. don't always, especially at least on, like, the man side, I know there's a lot of expectations about like only showing certain kinds of emotions. Kind of showing kinds. the tough, hard mind. Yeah, yeah. throwing like bull. Exactly. Throwing yeah. like bull. And that shit actually, like, I mean, going back to my comment about high school, I transferred a lot of reasons was the mental health reasons and like I just didn't feel I wasn't comfortable where I was at. Right. And it took, I feel like that could have happened so much sooner if I would just came, I would just true to myself and been like, yo, like, you, you're not, this isn't right for you. Like, you're, yeah. you're, you're bottling up emotions. Like, you know, let, let them out. And then like, I, because if you're going to live in that fear that we talked about, you're not going to make that risk of like right. what I did was just change schools. And I, like in the middle of junior year, I was like, all right, fuck it. Like I got to get out of here. Like, but it took so much longer than it needed to because I just like felt I couldn't express myself. I couldn't let myself be who I actually right. was. And so, like admit to like myself, all right, this is the change that I think I need. And let's just go with it. Like forget what might not might go wrong. Forget like what other people might think within the school I was leaving. Mm -hmm. My family, I was, or like friends, like fuck it. Like, just, I had to do what was best for me, and, like, my only regret, quote-unquote, was that I didn't do it sooner. Okay. And, yeah, but, like, you know, definitely let yourself be vulnerable. I think, to, to wrap this up, and I, I don't want to cut you yeah. off for the same thing. You should no, no, definitely no. wrap this up as well, I'll do it yourself. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> we're just we're at risking the, it, right? Yeah, no. We we're are just at, we're at the hands time. of technology. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to say before Armand wraps up that I'm sure Aid and I are both uh, incredibly appreciative that you have allowed us on this podcast, oh, and I, I hope that people who get to see it um, have a, a better sense of what it means to brisk it for the biscuit. <laughs> and if you don't get the biscuit, well, it's maybe, okay. Keep I'll, going, and eventually you will get there. I promise. There are more than biscuits. Options. Options. No, and if biscuits, biscuits aren't for like, you, I'm sure there's an alternative. Plenty of flavors, <laughs> like. But uh, you know, I will say I, uh, I I mean I'm incredibly fortunate to be on this podcast. I really hope that it blows up, and I know it will uh, in yes. due time. And you know, with a little bit of motivation to you, um, <laughs> I think uh, you know we can really she can really make something great out of this. So. And I know you two are gonna be doing big things too. And I'll bring you on the next podcast. You know, when he's a doctor, I hope. Actually, I'll bring you on sooner bring because that might have made a little time. Um, Aiden, but like, what's Thing. Like, yeah, what's the end goal for you? So, I'm doing another year in France, assuming this visa. I was mentioning it before, the visa stuff has been kind of tough recently. Okay. Um, but assuming that I'll go you know, eventually find figures well. itself out, um, another year out there, I come back, I'll have applied to grad schools for teaching in New York City, go to um, one of, you know, whichever one thinks that I'm all right. <laughs> and from there on, like, I'm trying to be, trying to be educated, trying to teach nice. history, Try to try to teach French. I'm gonna send my kids to you. Yo, pull up. If yo French lessons, let me know. I'm okay. 
um, for basic shit. Yeah. But anyway, we yeah. have everybody here who's going to make <laughs> such an incredible impact on the future and future generations. Word. And I'll say cheers to that. Yeah, I'll salt it. Cheers yeah, to a great episode and insightful and informative episode of Mama Wanda. Until next time. Yeah, it's time to it's, it's kind of like the way that Monica likes doing boxing as a side thing to kind of de-stress. Like, for me, it was writing. Mm -hmm. And I found that I'm a very, not to be conceited, but I'm a very good writer. No, he's good. So why not be able to, if I can articulate what's on my mind and put it on a piece of paper so that someone else who's thinking the same thing but can't really put it into words, if they can read and go, I know exactly what you're saying. Or if I can do that, you know, I want them to see that. And at first it was, I was doing it for myself. But now if I can do it for myself, but also so that other people can understand exactly what they're going through, be like, wow, like I just couldn't put that into words. It was great. So this 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 book is called Scars of Reminiscence and it goes over things of your past that you regret and it creates this this scar on you, this this traumatic wound that you'll stare at every day. And it's learning how to heal and how things will eventually it'll go back to normal, but it'll leave deep. something there. And you'll look at it and you go, you know what, I'm not going to look at that with malice. I'm not going to look at back and go, wow, like, I can't believe it did that. It's mm -hmm. like, that was a part of me. That's a battle wound right there. That's a battle wound. And you know, life is always going to be a battle. And uh, I've always looked at it as, we live in something called the fog of war, where wherever you get put into a new scenario, everything's foggy, we're disoriented, we don't know what we're going to do. And the excitement of life is trying to navigate through this fog. And once you're able to figure out how to navigate and become this traveler, and become this, you know, this captain of your own ship, then you can really start to appreciate everything around you. Mm. Scars of Reminiscence, be out in like eight years. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a new release for Greenberg's new book. All my friends are writing books nowadays. I don't know if you checked out, but my... I did. Uh, your friend... Uh, Melanie. Melanie. Melanie with uh, 52 Sundays, if yep. I'm not mistaken. Um, I just copped it. I haven't read anything yet, but... Oh, Cop it. It's on Amazon. Check her out. She's good. She's also called Rose Girl... Rose Gold Girl on YouTube. Um, but Greenberg, this is me announcing that you need to help me with my script because I'm writing a script for okay. myself. But Ooh. like, clearly, you're a man of great words. Many talents. Many, Many talents, talents, great words, and I need you to help me form those words. Because like, yeah. every time you say something, I'm like, that's exciting. Well, if you do need help translating into French to reach out to a different demographic. And then we, uh, we uh, over here. Yeah, multi-language. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 <laughs> that was our effort. Um, but yeah, catch us next time on Momo on the Move.